Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to talk about weathering the storm. But first, would you rise in honor with me as we sing God's praises together? Here we go, y'all. All I see is a battle. You see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I part, I'll part on my knees, with my hands lifted I, oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. If you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus is nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. All I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted I Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. everybody doing today that's good because so am I Same old for 
must tell the same old lies If you've been trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you've got pain He's a pain taker If you lost He's a way Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest faith But only trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak men strong the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His un. 
unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Join me in prayer. Oh God, we come before you today as your people, as your people who are going through storms and life, but we know, we know that you are present. And so we pray that you fill us with your presence now in this place, as we are in the boat with each other, with our brothers and sisters in you. Help us to know that you are here making yourself known in surprising and beautiful ways and that you call us and say to our very souls, peace, be still. Amen. Please be seated. And as you are taking your seats, I would like to invite any of my friends who would like to come forward to share in the children's blessing this week. And I welcome anybody who's joining us online. We are so glad that you guys are coming. And uh, as some of our friends are making way, how was school this week, right? Was it thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down? <gasps> thumbs up. Awesome. Very cool. How was school? Thumbs up, sideways, thumbs down. Thumbs up. How is school age? Oh, thumbs up all around. We've got some thumbs up for school. How is going back to school this week? Thumbs up, sideways down. Thumbs up. Cool. Well, that is great. And so today as we do our children's blessing, let us remember all of the kids and everybody and all your teachers who are going back, to, who went back to school, right? So how do we start this? We start with an L, right? We put it up to our shoulder and we say both with words and in signs, the Lord be with you as you worship and also with you as you worship. Thank you guys for being such a wonderful worship leader. We appreciate you so much. I don't know about the kids, but I was exhausted after school this week. <laughs> Our scripture today comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with them. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. 
And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God bless the reading of his word. Well, we are now in the fourth week of our sermon series, Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus. And I just want to do a little recap to show us or remind us of where we have been so far. Um, We began with Jesus going to his baptism and through 40 days in the wilderness. And we learned that walking in Jesus' footsteps means that we too need to be obedient to God and to resist temptation through the power of God's word in scripture. We walked with Jesus to Galilee as he began his public ministry in Capernaum with a focus on his healing ministry. And we talked about not only the physical maladies that Jesus healed, we also talked about the demons that many of us deal with today. Those addictions and experiences and yes, sins that keep us paralyzed and locked up, preventing us from being whole as God intends for each of us. And we learned how Jesus sets us free today as we pray and confess and open ourselves to his healing touch. Last Sunday, we talked about how Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God, calling us to recognize that God's kingdom is not only near, it is here. It is within us. And we talked about experiencing the presence and the power of God so that we can be salt and light in the world. As you and I repent and as we make a daily practice, just like Jesus did, of going to the mountaintop, of having a daily time of sacred space where you and I connect and hear God speak to our hearts. And now we're going to follow the footsteps of Jesus to the Sea of Galilee, where we find him spending the bulk of his three-year ministry preaching, teaching, and showing us what spiritual growth can look like as you and I go through tough times. So will you join me in prayer as we open our hearts to God? Loving and gracious God, we thank you that you are our cornerstone. We thank you that you provide us the way and the foundation that we need to live out our lives. And we pray, oh God, as we encounter the scriptures, I pray that the words of my mouth And the meditations of our hearts might be pleasing and acceptable to you. For you, O God, are our strength, our redeemer, our chain breaker. And we give you our thanks. Amen. Okay, so we're going to travel today to the Sea of Galilee. And uh, here is a Google map of that large lake. And I'm going to start by giving you a few fun facts about this body of water. As I said last week, its length is about 13 miles long, and at its widest point, it's about eight miles across. The Sea of Galilee is fed by the Jordan River to its north. I bet you didn't know that. Um, Actually, the Jordan River starts in the north, and it goes all the way through the Sea of Galilee into uh, the southern regions and empties into the Dead Sea. It's fed by a mountain range called Mount Hermon, where lots and lots of snowfall takes place, and it all feeds into the Jordan River, which feeds the Sea of Galilee. Um, The river continues, as I said, it empties into the Dead Sea, where nothing lives. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. And the Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater body on the place of any place in the planet. It's the largest freshwater body. It's second only to the Dead Sea in being the lowest body of water on the earth, period. So as you can see, um, its shape looks a little bit like a harp. And that's why you will sometimes read in the Bible a, a reference to this body of water, not only as the Sea of Galilee, but sometimes you'll see it called the Sea of Gennesaret or Knezeret, which is actually the Hebrew word for harp or lyre. So that's why it's named that. Also, most of the time we know that it's just called the Sea of Galilee because of the region uh, that is around it. 
Um, finally, there's one more fun fact. 43 times in the Gospels, we hear the word boat mentioned on this sea. So Jesus, in his ministry, was clearly in and out of boats, fishing with his disciples, using them a boat as a pulpit and as transportation to get to one side to the other of this great lake called the Sea of Galilee to take his message of God's kingdom and love and acceptance and grace and healing to everybody he could. Yes, boats were often a place where miracles, miracles happened in Jesus's ministry. So today we're going to focus on three of the gospel stories that take place on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And the one I'd like to begin with is the story of Jesus calling his first disciples. It's the first time we see Jesus in a boat. And do you remember it? Jesus is preaching on the shore of Capernaum. And if you look at that map again, you'll see Capernaum right at the top uh, western side um, of the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus' headquarters was. He was preaching by the lake, and they kept, more and more people came, and it kept pushing Jesus closer and closer to the water. So he looks around, and he sees two boats, two fishing boats, out just a little bit. And so he calls on a fisher named Simon, and he asks him if he can be in the boat so that he can preach. And Simon consents, even though he's been out fishing all night, he consents and Jesus preaches. Now, one of the things you need to know about, and you, I, I'm sure you do know this, when you're on the water, what happens? It's a natural amplifier. So this would have been one of the ways that Jesus was able to communicate with large crowds. They could understand everything he was saying. And um, so anyway, as he's doing this, they, they you know, the disciples, are, the would-be disciples have been out fishing all night, we know. And um, I want to talk a little bit about fishing because we're going to uh, talk about what Jesus says after he finishes teaching, which is to ask them to push out further to shore and go for a catch, he calls it. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about fishing um, on the Sea of Galilee. The best time to fish is at night. Now, why is that? Well, the first thing is that the lake becomes fairly calm at night. I don't know if y'all have ever been on a lake, but usually things kind of calm down. The winds calm down at night. It's easier to be unencumbered. Um, but the other thing is that during the day, it gets very, very hot. The water gets hot. And so when the sun sets, the water cools, and then the fish will go up closer to the surface. So it makes for better fishing conditions. But um, another reason is something I really hadn't thought about until I saw an interview, and our Sunday school class actually saw this today, with a fisherman from the area. And he said that the reason that they fish at night with their nets is because the fish can't see the nets like they can see it during the day. And that makes sense, right? Um, fish, they, they can't see, it's dark. So Simon's been out all night, caught nothing, and which isn't great for, you know, his business or his pocketbook. And he, along with the others, is understandably tired and discouraged. But in spite of that, we are told in the story, when asked, Jesus, uh, they take Jesus out to the water. Um, and after he finishes, Jesus says, let's go fishing. And it's here when Simon explains the facts to Jesus. Because after all, Jesus is not a professional, and they are. And he says, look, Lord, uh, we've been out all night. We have been fishing, we are tired, we haven't caught a thing. But if you say so, we'll do it, we'll do it. So they go out about 100 yards or so off the shore, and they cast their nets over, and what happens? It's filled to the brim. It is so full, they have to get the other boat over there to get, get all these fish in, and it is an amazing catch of fish. Now, you would think that Simon would be overjoyed. But we are told he isn't overjoyed at all. In fact, he's terrified. He falls to his knees and he says to Jesus, get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. To which Jesus says, don't be afraid, Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. And Simon, who is later renamed Peter, along with his friends, leave everything behind to follow Jesus. 
I want to encourage you not to miss those moments when Christ calls you. At first, like Peter, we might come up with a thousand excellent excuses for not accepting the call. I do that, and I suspect so do you. But here's the thing. When you are willing to take the risk and say yes to Jesus, you will find out what you are made for. I have seen it happen in my life, and I've seen it happen in others' lives again and again and again. So we have two questions from this story. First is, who is this man, Jesus? And the second is, what does this story mean for you and for me today? Because each of us is called for something. And that's the spiritual journey, is to find that call and go with Jesus into it. The second story comes from our text today in Mark's Gospel, where Jesus and his disciples are crossing over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And just for a moment, let's take a talk about the boat that they would have been traveling in. Um, what do we know about it? Because actually we know quite a bit. Um, and that's because in 1986, there was a discovery. There was a terrible drought in the area. Um, much like what's going on in the western United States today, y'all have seen the, you know, things that have happened there. The lake was drying up. The floor that is near the shore was a muddy mess. But in this mud, they find an old boat in the Sea of Galilee. And after careful excavation, they ended up carbon dating it. And guess what? It was from the first century. The first century. It was from the same time that Jesus walked the earth. And so the boat was 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four feet deep. And it can hold up to about 12 people. So if you go with me next May to the Holy Land, you'll get a chance to see this in person. But I wanted to show you a picture of this so you can kind of get a, get a flavor for it. It's called the Jesus Boat because it could indeed be one of the boats that Jesus traveled in. In that first century. So in our reading today, we are told that Jesus has been preaching and teaching and healing all day. And by evening, he is exhausted. Now, and he, and he lays his head down in the stern of the boat on a cushion and he falls fast asleep. Now, I can totally relate to this. I mean, I, I want you to know that after preaching and teaching and visiting with people and like after church, sometimes I go and visit lots of our homebound members. By the time I get home, I am exhausted, physically, mentally, spiritually depleted. And so I lay down a lot of times and take a nap. So this doesn't surprise me at all. But the other thing that doesn't surprise me is that um, about being on the boat and being asleep. Um, one of the things that I've done a lot of, uh, I've been I've been on big boats and been on cruises, but I've also been on little boats. My dad um, owned a boat, and we'd go to the Bahamas every summer. And um, the trip would start at midnight, and we'd get there about morning time. And it was so wonderful because, um, and we traveled at night because the ocean was calmer. But it was just such a lovely motion that just well, is like rocking me to sleep every night. And I loved those trips. But our text today tells us that in the middle of the night, a squall comes up on the Sea of Galilee. And what happens? Well, the waves get really big. I've been there before when there's been a storm on the Sea of Galilee, and they can get seven to eight feet tall, those waves. And so think about that. If you're in a 27-foot in a boat, you don't have a motor, you just have oars, and how scary that could be out in the middle of eight miles across, you find yourself in this storm. It was, must have been terrifying. But in the midst of this, we hear that Jesus is asleep. Finally, the disciples come and they shake him awake and they say, Jesus, <laughs> we're going to drown. Can't you help us? Don't you care about us? And I can just imagine what's going on in Jesus' mind, thinking, don't you guys get it yet? Didn't you see me cast out demons and they had to flee? Didn't you see me open the eyes of the blind and the lame could walk after I touched them? Do you really think we're going to drown out here? Why are you so afraid? I'm here in the boat with you. And then just to make sure they understand, Jesus cries out, 
peace. Be silent. Be still. And suddenly the wind dies, and the waves settle, and all is still. And the disciples say to each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And it's here that the disciples are starting to get it. Because you see, their Bible, which we call the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, tells them that there is only one who can control the wind and the waves. Only one. Psalm 89 says this, O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You rule over the surging sea. When the waves rise, you do what? Still them. So this man in the boat with them, in some way they don't fully yet comprehend, is God in their midst. The God who is the ruler of the universe comes in human flesh, the incarnate God. And they are coming, the disciples are coming to realize that this is no ordinary man. But it goes beyond that. What Jesus is pointing here is the role that he is to play in all of our lives. And that's because we all sail through storms in our lives. Amen? Amen. We all have periods when the seas get rough and tumultuous, when the winds uh, and waves threaten to capsize our boat, where we can't figure out how we are going to make it through. And it is terrifying. And what these stories tell us is that Christ is already there in the boat with us. And he'll sail with us through these times and these storms if, and this is a big if, if we will let him. Now, the promise isn't that Jesus is going to magically make the storms vanish. And it's certainly not a promise that we'll never have rough seas in our lives. No, the promise is that no matter what you go through, no matter who you are, where you are, no matter how you are terrified, Jesus says to you and to me, I will be with you. I will take care of you one way or another. That the worst thing that you're going through is never the last thing. So do not be afraid, Jesus says to each of us. We will get through it together. So Jesus is in the boat when you're in the stormy seas. He's with you in the middle of it, in the darkness. He's there when you have no life preservers on. In the midst of the waves and the wind and the scary darkness, he is still in the boat with you and with me. But here's an important question. Will you let him be captain? Are you going to trust him? Really trust him? Which leads us to the third story, and this one, of course, is the story of Jesus walking on the water. I'm sure all of us remember that one. The disciples are out on the boat in the middle of the night, and Jesus isn't in the boat with them. But Jesus approaches them walking on water. And at first, they think it is a ghost. And who can blame them? We would all think that. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me. And so Simon Peter says, well, if you are the one you say you are, then bid me to come out to be with you on the water. And I think that's the absolutely ridiculous <laughs> If he's a ghost, I mean, just saying. Anyway, so he, he does, he steps out on the water. He's looking at Jesus. Jesus says, come on. He's looking at Jesus. And as long as he's keeping his eyes focused on Jesus, what? He's walking on the water, walking on the water. But then what does he do? He starts looking down. And as soon as he does, what happens? He stinks like a lead balloon, and he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And, of course, Jesus does. He takes him by the hand, and he leads him back to the boat, and we are told that he climbs in with him. Yes, Jesus will climb into the boat with you, even in the middle of a storm like no other. All you have to do is two things. First, ask him to, right? And then repent. Turn around from where you're focused on all of the wrong things. And then turn back and look at Jesus. 
turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That is one of my favorite hymns. So what happens? The water becomes calm, the winds die down, and this time the disciples finally get it figured out. They fall on their knees, and what do they do? They worship him, and they say, truly, you are the Son of God. So here we have three stories of Jesus and his disciples that point us to three phases, what I believe are three phases of spiritual growth in our lives. Let's look at each one of the responses of, of each of the stories. The first one is Peter in the boat. He's been called. He gets the fish, and it says, Peter falls to his knees and says, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please just leave. Can't take it. The second one is the disciples in the boat, and Jesus is asleep, and they say, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And the third one is, truly you are the Son of God. Three stages to finding growth in our relationship with Jesus Christ. On my way to church this morning, I was thinking about this, and um, a story came to me. I, some of you have heard parts of this story before, but I felt like it needed to be shared again today. And that is um, a story about my dad. And uh, when he was 49, he died of lung cancer. And um, part of the story you know about once he was in the hospital, but the other part of the story you don't know about is what led up to that. You see, my dad um, was probably what most people would call a self-made man. He was very, very successful in his work, and he poured himself into building a, a business and becoming very successful in the world's eyes. My dad was also addicted to tobacco, and he smoked cig cigarettes like they were like he was a chimney. It was like three or four packs a day. His fingers were orange from all of the of the uh, nicotine and the tobacco. And um, over the years, I remember growing up and mom and dad saying they were going to quit. Of course, they were they were pharmacists. They knew better. They were going to quit smoking, but they never did. And then um, he ended up in the hospital because he was having a hard time breathing. And then he found out that he was diagnosed with lung cancer. And at that very moment, he took his pack of cigarettes and he threw it across the room. And he never picked up another cigarette, but it was too late. Um, my dad uh, was very angry. He's very angry at God. And he's very angry at himself. And so for the next 10 months leading up to the time when he went to be with the Lord, it was a struggle. It was like a storm like no other. And um, he had a time of coming to terms with um, his faith. Now, he'd gone to church all of his life. He was a Christian. All of us go through storms of our li in our lives. And we have to find that place where we can meet with God and we can grow in trust. That happened for my dad, but it took a long time. It took um, about seven or eight months of very, very hard storms that he went through. But I will never forget, about a month before he passed, I was visiting with him, and he said, um, we were talking about God's healing. And he says, you know what, Susan? He said, God heals in all kinds of different ways. And he says, I want you to know, I'm okay. It is well with my soul. And I realized that's where Jesus was with him in his boat. Today, as we are gathered here today, um, I want us to think about a word. The word is nave. Have you ever heard of the word nave? N-A-V-E. Uh, navel comes from it. Um, but it's a, a Latin word, navus, which means ship or boat. And the word is used to speak of the structure of a sanctuary building, church building, in this area right here where you are seated. This is called the nave of the church. This, you are in the ship right here. And this is a reminder to us that Jesus is with us in the boat. This is also a you know, metaphor for our lives. We're all on a boat making this journey that we're making. And the question is... 
Where are we in our relationship with Christ? Is he the captain of the boat? Or are we trying to do that ourselves? My dad had to get to the place where he was willing to let Jesus be the captain of his boat. And you and I are too. And so today, as we come to the communion table, I love this because, you know, this is part of the boat too. And I think about this being the place where Jesus was kind of taking a little nap. And the disciples come to him and say, help us, Lord, help us. And this is the place where we are reminded that Jesus was willing to be our Savior. He was willing to give himself so that you and I might know the life that he offers. And so today, as you and I come to the communion table to receive the gifts of God for us, bring yourselves, bring your storms, bring your worries, bring your struggles, bring yourselves and offer yourselves once again to him. Um, our prayer stations today are, um, as you come and have communion in the front and move that way back to your seats, today we, um, I did a labor of love. I made some cookies for you all, and they are in the shape of a boat, of a sailboat. And so um, it may look like an airhead. I've been told it looks like a Christmas tree. I'm not the best baker in the world, but I did my best. So the main thing is to remember that he goes with you. He goes with you wherever you are. Make yourself available to him. Ask him what your, pur what your purpose is and allow him to do that great work in you and through you. And the people of God said, amen and amen. amen. Will you please stand as you're able as we sing our song of praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. this time of communion where all are invited, where we physically remember that Jesus is with us. And we remember how he talked to those disciples who were on the boats with him and to us too. And at a meal, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body that is given for you. Every time you eat this, Remember that I am with you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he passed it among them. And he said, take, drink, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you sending your son to be in the boat with us. We want to thank you for all the things that you do each and every day for everyone. Whether they understand it or not, you are there with us. You are holding us. You are loving us. Let us take these elements, this bread, that body that it represents, that was broken for each one of us. The cup to wash away our sins and make us clean. These emblems of your son that you sent 
for us, to show us the way and let us walk with him when we choose to make those decisions. So Father, bless these emblems and bless these people. Amen.
I get the opportunity to talk about our call to give of your time, treasure, and talents. If you are visiting with us today, online or in person, all we ask is you fill out the communication card so we may know you were with us today and the church would have a small gift for you. We have many ministry needs and opportunities for giving of your resources. Shower ministry, feeding the multitudes, worship and wonder volunteers, and the school supply drive, just to name a few. I'm going to highlight the wonderful works of our school supply team. Mark 9, 35. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be the first must be the least of all and the servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child, placed him among the twelve, and embraced him. Then he said, Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. Our school supply drive, as our church welcomes the children back to school, we do something no other Boone County church does. We actually take orders from the schools and provide exactly what they need. School started Thursday in Boone County and welcomed back to 27 different school sites, over 20,000 students. 43% of those students in Boone County are living near, at, or below the poverty line, which makes them eligible to receive the supplies that we are providing. These supplies are purchased, sorted, counted, and packed, delivered to schools entirely by Lord's Christian Church volunteers, completely volunteer staff. Supplies given to students in need by schools are given out by the uh, Youth Service and Resource Centers. Family Resource Youth Service Centers. I should know that. I've worked with them for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have raised over $4,300, which is $300 more than our goal of $4,000. But we're not finished. We are never finished. The shopping team continues to shop as additional funds are needed and additional funds are donated. We continue to not only provide for this year, but we have already started gathering supplies for next school year. So, how can you help? Well, this project continues through the end of August, so there's still time to donate. In your bulletins today, you have an envelope. You can donate here. As you came in the church, there was an envelope. You can donate that way. You can go online and also make a donation in that way. So all of those ways you can help. The other way that you can help is that they are, we are still packing school supplies in the activity center. We will be packing this Sunday and next after worship. They were, uh, as I got here this morning in between services, bringing in the supplies that Amy and I went out yesterday and was, was still purchasing for our drive. Dropped those things off. They were packing and counting things today. They'll be doing that after this service. Next Sunday also. Do you have to sign up for this? No. You can just show up. Malia will find a way for you to help. So, as we respond to God's call to form faith every day, with our time, talent, and treasure, know that you are making a difference in your life, in your church, and in your world. Thank you for giving in Jesus' name. And as we think about the gifts of time, talent, and treasures, we also remember that this is a reminder that our lives are a ship, like a ship. We're out in the world, we're doing things, and the question is, who is our captain? Are we trying to be our own? Or are we allowing Christ to be the captain of our lives? Today, we want to also invite you to think about dedicating your life, rededicating your life. That's, I say this every single week. Every single week, I rededicate my life during worship. And so we invite you to take a moment to do that if you have need. And if in the last few weeks, we've had six families that have joined the church. If you are thinking about doing that and haven't done that yet, but are thinking about it, we invite you during this time of invitation to respond to the call of God on your life. So let's stand together as we sing our final hymn and our song, and we'll do it.
blessed week. Know that God goes with you. Amen.